Well, good morning, everybody. It's a delight to uh, see you this on this uh, cold morning. We had our first snow in Ithaca. I woke up this morning, came out, and uh, little snow flurries coming by my window. So uh, winter is winter is upon us, and uh, which is a great time to talk about things that uh, researchers and scientists and agriculturalists like to do in the summer. And um, so welcome to the 2020 Northeastern IPM Research Update Conference. Uh, we have a truncated uh, agenda today, so just an hour. It's going to be fun. We have lots of uh, five minute, really short uh, presentations for you, and then we will um, be taking your Q&A. So I'm just going to go through a, a little part of, uh, of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, my name, by the way, is Jana Hexter. I work for the Northeastern IPM Center. And um, there is going to be a recording of this uh, presentation and it will be available probably in about a week. And anyone who is registered will get a copy of the recording. It'll also be up on our website so you can come and uh, look at it again in your leisure. So if there's something that you miss, you can come back and, and review it. Uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, we love your questions and uh, feel free to uh, use the Q&A feature. Um, which if you scroll over your, um, your Zoom uh, window, you'll see in the box there, the black box that shows up either at the top or the bottom. In the middle, there's a box that says Q&A. And if you click on there, you can ask questions. You can do so anonymously, or you can put your name in there. Um, if there are links that you want to put in for presenters, uh, you could put that in the chat. Um, that's a better way of sharing information. But if it's just a question, um, it's better to put it in the q and I'll monitor that. And then when we have our little breaks, I can uh, ask the questions. Um, so uh, with that, we are going to um, uh, we're going to begin. And so our first presentation is by Juliet Carroll um, for the New York State IPM program. And we'll just give us a second to transition to that. Good morning. Today I'm going to tell you about our project, which involves building a new website for NUA, the Network for Environment and Weather Applications. NUA is a set of IPM forecast tools with a proven track record of enhancing IPM. Well, what's the one cool thing I wanted to share with you today about our project? It's the NUA dashboard. Basically, you're going to sign in and set up your profile, and the NUA dashboard is going to display just the tools you want from where you want. And the system is going to save your biofix states for those tools that require them, so you don't have to enter them over and over and over again. Like other websites, you're going to sign in initially with your email address and your password and agree to the NUA data use policy. That'll take you to the profile pages where you'll set up your personal information, your name, email, and state or province. And then you're going to go to select your favorite stations. You can see here I've got eight stations saved in my favorites. I can search for them in this drop down bar here, or I can zoom in on the map and search for them on the map and click or tap on the icon. If it's a favorite, it'll show up with a gold star. Next, I'm going to go to the NUA tools page in the profile. There are five categories of NUA tools, and here I've expanded the Apple tools menu so you can see what there is to select from. And I've chosen Apple Maggot by clicking the slider bar on. Apple Maggot has recently been built out and I need to go into it to review it. Then I'm gonna go to the other tools part of the profile and select any other tools that I might wanna have on my dashboard. These are tools that are outside of NUA that might be state, regional, or national tools. Here's the other crop and IPM tools menu expanded out. And you can see that I've selected two of these to show up on my dashboard. I then can click 
on the dashboard menu item. It takes me to my dashboard and you can see my favorite stations here. It's showing Fredonia. This drop down list will expand out with just my favorite stations and I can switch that at any time to get the results for any of those stations. It'll show the overview for the weather station, in this case, Fredonia, New York, and I can edit this overview at any time to change the items in this region. A five-day weather forecast is shown and the NUA weather tools are linked on the dashboard as well as a regional radar for the location that you're in. So what about the Apple Maggot tool? This is what shows up. For the current day, a message indicating the risk from that pest, the accumulated degree days since January 1, and the accumulated degree days since first trap catch. I can also go to the tool and interact with it the same way I would on the current website, except with increased capability. Because only my favorite stations are going to show up on that full model tool. Now, if I click out of my browser, I don't have to log in again because when I go back to nua.cornell.edu on my browser, it's going to take me direct to my dashboard page. If I log out, I will have to log in again. Below this display are those other tools that I talked about. Thank you so much for your attention today, and I want to thank everyone that is part of the NUA fabric. Make sure to visit nua.cornell.edu and test drive us. Great. Thank you very much, Julie. And Julie will be answering your questions um, in about five minutes after we've uh, watched the next video, which is from Michael Wolfen on the development of ETH tubes as a new pest management tactic for IPM of mushroom flies. And uh, Michael is uh, with us from Penn State today. Hi, everybody, and welcome to my talk. My name is Mike Wolfen, and I'm a postdoc in the Baker Jenkins Mushroom Pest Research Team. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the products and methods that we're using to control mushroom forage flies on mushroom farms. First, a quick note about mushroom farming. Uh, mushrooms are grown indoors in individual growing rooms. Um, here you can see on this farm, which is a pretty typical farm, there's 35 individual growing rooms. Um, this is what a growing room looks like during cropping, during uh, when they are harvesting. And, but typically uh, the mushrooms are grown in dark humid conditions as you can see here, which are perfect for insect uh, pests. The mushrooms are grown year round and there are different stages of mushroom growth. Um, and oftentimes the growing rooms that have the mushrooms in them are in different stages and they're adjacent to one another. Meaning that an insect pest that's leaving a late stage growing room to go find a uh, early stage growing room in which to lay its eggs won't have to fly very far in order to get um, to find a, a, a better stage of crop to lay their eggs. Um, and this is makes it really easy on the insects to uh, build their numbers throughout the year. The pest that I'm going to talk about today is Megacelia halterata, the mushroom forward fly. Uh, it's a direct pest by feeding on the actively growing mycelia of the mushroom, but it's also a vector of disease. Um, they infest the mushroom farms by hundreds of thousands and millions and millions of flies in a single growing room. They also invade the community. Um, as you can see here, there is a neighborhood that has been integrated in next to these uh, mushroom farms. In a lot of the cases, the, the, uh, the neighborhoods um, were built next to the mushroom farms. The mushroom farms were there first. And people are getting, again, hundreds of thousands of flies in their houses every day. My job is to suppress the forward fly populations. I do this by screening new insecticides in the lab. I do this by um, doing field trials of the new insecticides. And finally, by facilitating the adoption of these new insecticides. Here are the results of the lab screening. You can see here that we identified three classes of insecticides. I want to focus your attention on uh, the plant essential oils and silica. That's what we moved forward with. 
because they're FIFA 25B exempt products, meaning they can be used on the farms immediately. We don't have to wait for labeling. For the field trials, we applied these products on the outskirts of the doors, um, any of the holes that needed to be plugged up, as well as the attics and the windows to the rooms to try to get them at the points of entry when they're entering and leaving um, the, the growing rooms to go to different, to go to different growing rooms. Uh, this, is our, this is our trap data. So on the y-axis, you can see here the number of forage we caught per day. And on the x-axis, you can see time. Uh, the white bars indicate control data and the gray and black bars indicate the two different treatments we had. And as you can see, early season, we were able to significantly reduce the forward fly populations on the farms. Um, in the middle of the growing season, we don't have any data on that because our farmers were forced to um, shut down our control rooms because the forward fly pressure were too high. However, the treatments were not shut down. They were still able to get crops off of it. Late in the season, when frost sets to uh, begins to kick in, but it's not consistent, there's still flies, um, our treatments were even more effective then. So uh, we were really excited about these results. I would like to direct your attention to one specific type of treatment we used, uh, where there's a metal flap window in the back of the growing rooms uh, used to vent and regulate temperature. Um, what we did was we uh, covered that vent with an electrostatic screen that we impregnated with Ecovia WD. Um, and if a picture says a thousand words, this picture is going to show about a million flies. So this is what we saw after two weeks in one growing room. Here's a video just showing the sheer number of flies that we were able uh, to kill um, over. And what I did was I rounded them up. I counted them. I uh, estimated them by weight. Um, in a two week period, in one room, we were able to kill about 935,000 flies that wouldn't uh, have been killed otherwise. And that doesn't even count uh, the large, large number of flies that were on the ground below the uh, windows. So we're really excited about this treatment. We've repeated it a couple of times. I'm excited to analyze the data. The data is still ongoing because right now is peak fly season. Uh, with that, I'd like to um, ask if there's any questions, acknowledge everybody who's helped me with this study. You can contact me at this email address or call me at the Mushroom Forward Fly Hotline, which I operate uh, to interact with farmers and the community. Thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoyed my talk. Great, wonderful. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, so we actually don't have uh, any questions that have come through the Q&A yet. But so if anyone who is a panelist um, has a question, I see that um, Natalie Basil has her hand up. So I can uh, unmute you, uh, Natalie, and maybe there's a question that uh, you would like to ask. Um, Okay, let me see if I can do that. Oh, she took her hand down. So I guess she figured out whatever it was. Um, so I actually have a question for you, Michael. It's like how, I know they have mushroom farming in Pennsylvania is how prevalent is it in the, in the Northeast? Um, I'll answer that question by saying that the county that all of our mushroom farms are in produces about two thirds of the, uh, all of the mushrooms grown in North America. So, mm -hmm. Uh, it's shipped all over the country to Canada, to Mexico, um, and really the Chester County where all the mushrooms are grown is where almost all of the mushrooms are grown in, in the continent. Uh -huh. Wow, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. So, um, and Samantha Wilden asked, uh, do growers set aside a rest greenhouse between cropping intervals to reduce pest buildup between intervals? No, they don't. Um, and they, they say, I've, we've talked about that, and they, they just say they can't afford to, to not grow crop in um, one of these growing rooms. Uh, interestingly, though, they um, have moved to what's called block filling, where they try to time every uh, greenhouse or, or growing room next to one another uh, to try to make them to be about the same stage. That way, they can't just go through the building. They would have to uh, fly further to another room to find an appropriate room. But even still, the rooms are all pretty close to one another. Great. And uh, Serdan As Asimovic from uh, Cornell said, can you explain the size of the mesh on the electrostatic material that you used sure. in the vent? I've actually got some on my desk right here. Um, 
so this is this is the mesh that I was using. Um, I think it's about yeah one one uh, millimeter um, pore size. But if if you want, you can email me and I'll I'll send you the the actual specs. It's really useful because I didn't mention in my talk that the electrostatic mesh um, is is negative is charged. It's electrostatically charged, meaning that uh, when we apply the powder to it, the plow, the powder adheres. And it stays on the the screen for a much longer time, so it's it's not necessarily the pore size that's important. It's the electrostatic property that it has. Okay, great. Well, we should move on to keep things moving along. There's actually some questions that have come in in the Q and A and on the chat, so maybe Michael can uh, respond to those that way, or we can come back to them at another uh, Q and A break. So thanks for your great questions. So our next. Um, our next video is from Long He. He actually can't be here today, uh, but he has somebody here to answer questions. And um, he, uh, his project is can canopy density measurement for precision spraying in fruit orchards. And um, he comes to us from uh, Penn State University. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Long He. I came from Penn State Department of Agriculture and Biological Engineering. Uh, today, I'm very glad to uh, give a presentation on updating some of my research progress on a project named an Intention Spraying System for Tree Fruit Crop Pest Management. Uh, first, I would like to <clears throat> give a brief introduction about, about this project. So the primary goal for this project is to introduce an Intention Sprayer System to tree fruit growers and also enhance the technology should for uh, tree canopy and orchard terrains in Pennsylvania. Um, there are three specific scopes for this project. The first one is to investigate the tree canopy measurement for precision spraying. Uh, that's particularly for measurement, measure the tree canopy density. And the second one is to integrate and evaluate of an intelligent spray system that is for the pest management and for tree fruit crops in the orchards. Mm -hmm. And the third one is to, uh, uh, to conduct some extension outreach activities that uh, can engage growers um, for them to get to know the system and also potentially use the system in their orchard. Um, so in the past year, we are typically um, mainly working on the two different tasks. One, the first one is to measure the tree canopy density. Uh, so we, you can see we developed a uh, sensing system using a LiDAR, a LiDAR sensor and then mounted on a frame that attached to a, a utility vehicle. We drove, we drove this, um, this system along the, uh, in the tree rows, between the tree rows and then uh, measured the tree canopy from both sides of the tree. We conduct this test in, uh, in two different orchards. Uh, one is with high uh, like toss window and the other one is with, um, with fruiting wall. So this two uh, tree uh, orchard has different canopy density. Um, so as you know that um, um, that, that spirit has multiple nozzles and then uh, to cover the whole tree canopy, each nozzle can target for a section of the tree. So we are also divide the, uh, those, those uh, acquired uh, points into four different sections and then we can calculate the density, the canopy density for each canopy, uh, each canopy section. And also we can calculate the canopy volume for each individual tree. And furthermore, we can also um, generate the canopy density map for, for the individual, individual trees. And you can see here, so with a very small grid, and we can see the whole the canopy density in the, uh, in, in the whole tree canopy. Um, and also, we consider about the terrain issues uh, in Pennsylvania, because mo mo uh, a lot of orchards are, are located in a um, hilly condition. Uh, we consider about three different terrain issues. One is using, you can see the first is longitudinal slope, and then the second one is, uh, is um, uh, lateral slope, and the third one is the combination of the two. Um, so we can see if there's some points we collect from the sensor uh, uh, is here, but if there are terrain changes, uh, uh, like the heading angle or, or other, uh, the, the, the other angle changes, and then the point can be uh, can be changed to another location. So we need to correct those points uh, in order to get a more precise canopy locations for for the sprayer. So we use the same sensor system like that here, and then but I also added a INS GNS system. That is, this sensor is, is including um, uh, initial measurement unit and also a GPS. So based on that, we can uh, we can correct the sensors. 
uh, reading and then get the correct allocation of the points. Uh, we conduct this test at different uh, orchards blocks in our research or field here. And then here are listed three examples. Uh, the red points here are the, are the points that we recorded originally from the sensor, and then we correct them into the blue points here. Um, and then another thing that we have done is, uh, is to test a intention sprayer system. We purchased this system and those integrating with a LiDAR sensor and a GPS. We have done the, the function test that uh, using the LiDAR to sensing the obstacles and then to provide guidelines for controlling on, turn on and off the nozzles. And also we are planning to do some field tests in the, in the coming season. So mainly working on two uh, different type of um, um, pest control. One is disease control, apple scab control, and the other one is to control the Japanese beetles. Uh, we will compare the intent intent sprayer and also conventional sprayer. So we will compare eventually compare the the, the amount of pesticide usage and also uh, the pest control uh, performance. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so that's all for me. Um, I, I list my contact information here. In case you have any question, please reach out to me uh, and I would be more than happy to answer. Uh, I also would like to thank you again for the USDA NEPA CPPM program for support this study. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, Long he uh, could pulled away today and so but uh, his grad student, uh, Mohammed Sultan Mahmoud, is here and will be happy to answer questions in five minutes after we have watched the next video, which is uh, by Samantha Wilden on the use of photoselective plastics for IPM on low tunnel strawberry. And she comes to us from Cornell University. And feel free to put your questions uh, in the Q&A, or it seems like we're using the chat this morning as a small enough group, we can do that. Hi everyone, my name is Samantha Wilden and I am a PhD student at Cornell University and today I'll be speaking to you on the use of UV selective plastics for IPM on low tunnel strawberry and to introduce my topic I'm going to narrate a short video for you. There are dozens of options for selecting a plastic for high and low tunnels, each with different features and capabilities that impact plant yield. We will discuss one important feature of plastics used in protected culture, UV selectivity and how this type of photoselectivity affects plant and pest management practices. Plastics range in how they transmit and diffuse light. Natural light that affects plant growth is composed of visible light, ultraviolet radiation or wavelengths of light that gives you sunburns, and infrared light, the kind of light you can't see but feel is heat. Plastics can be purchased to block, partially transmit, or fully transmit these different types of light. The effect of UV selective films on plant yield is largely variable. Although there is some considerable evidence that such films affect plant characteristics and pest pressure. Now to view the rest of that video, please visit the Tunnel Berries YouTube channel that has actual voice recordings. All right, so to start our IPM research on motel strawberries, um, we decided to look at four different treatments. So the first, a no plastic control, which was just open bed strawberries, a Dubois plastic, which was high UV transmitting, a tough light plastic, which was partially uh, UV transmitting, and then finally a warp plastic that was UV blocking. And these graphs just show light intensity or spectral irradiance over wavelength. So we see this effect for UVB radiation. So we first um, wanted to look at how UV selective films implant tarsh plant bug density. So tarsh plant bug is a key pest of strawberry and a major um, uh, part of an IPM program for strawberries. So when we look at tarsh plant bug per flower cluster over our four treatments that increased in UV limitation, we didn't see any difference in density. However, when we look at the proportion of observed fruit that has tarsh plant bug damage, we see that damage decreased as we went forward in our UV limitation plastics. We did see that yield was high under all plastics compared to the open field. So our result here is that there was no effect on density. However, their damage did decrease with UV blocking plastics. When we actually looked at managing tarsh plant bug, we started with looking at efficacy of Bulvaria bosniana. Bavaria is an entomopathogen that's used in many IPM programs. 
So to conduct these experiments, we first sprayed auger plates with two strains of bulvaria. We covered those plates with different um, UV selective uh, treatments. We then exposed those plates to UVB radiation and we incubated them and looked at spore survival. And we saw that as UV limitation increased, we saw a higher number of colony forming units of bulvaria. So we had high um, success for the warps and aluminum foil treatments that block UV. So the result here, the UV blocking plastics did result in better spore survival. When we took this one step further to look at management um, of live tarnished plant bugs, so comparing Bulvaria bassiana pathogenicity, we approached this problem similarly, but instead of um, inoculating auger with Bulvaria, we sprayed live insects with Bulvaria, covered them with our plastic treatments, and then exposed them to UV. And then we looked at survival of these bugs over time. And this is the result here. So we have survival probability on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And we look at our different treatments. As we increase in UV limitation, we actually saw decreased survival. So the controls in the mesh treatment that had more UV transparency out survived the ones that were blocked by UV. So the spores survived better for these plastic treatments than they did when they were exposed to UV. So the result here is that we saw increased insect survival um, under the UV transparent treatments and decreased survival when UV was limited. So in summary, first, UV selective plastics improved yield and reduced tarnished plant bug damage. Two, UV selective plastics improved survival of bulvaria. And then three, UV selective plastics improved pathogenicity against tarnished plant bug. Thank you all for viewing my talk. If you have a question, please email me and please go to the YouTube Tunnelberries um, page for more videos. Thank you. Great, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I love how these uh, these videos get kind of get mixed up, you know, whatever time slot someone comes in for. Um, so let me see. I'm not seeing any new questions that have come in. Uh, but I'm going to just go back because there was a question, two questions that didn't get answered about the mushrooms. So if Michael uh, would like to uh, step in there. Uh, Farouk Zaman asked, uh, what do the growers do with the spent media after growing mushrooms? Yep, I was actually just typing that answer. Um, so after the 45 or 60 day growing period, depending on how long the growers um, are able to grow crops, they steam off the, the compost. Um, so they, they raise the, they uh, pour in steam into the growing rooms and they raise the temperature above 220 degrees for 24 hours to completely kill everything that's in there, both uh, whatever the mushrooms that are in the compost, um, any parasites or uh, bacteria, anything like that. Um, and it's supposed to kill the flies. The problem is that uh, the temperature takes a long time to get that high. And during that time, the flies leave the rooms and they and that's why we're applying our pesticides um, at the ports of entry and, and exit is because we're trying to get uh, the flies as they're leaving the rooms and we know they do. Great, lovely. Um, and so I have a question for Mahmoud, um, which is um, uh, the difference between, it's from Glencola, the difference between LIDAR and previous smart spray attack is 3D versus 2D visualization of canopy, is that correct? Uh, the, the question is about the difference between the LiDAR and the previous smart, yeah. The difference between uh, these two is we are trying to develop something in 3D that can accurately locate the position of the canopy. Because if you have the X, Y, and Z axis, then you can accurately locate where the position of the canopy is. The previous uh, smart guided system intelligence player, they have only the 2D, 2D canopy density measurements that uh, are not precisely located at the position of the canopy. And that's, that can cause some off-target depositions. Great. And uh, Brian Brown said it was a great presentation, Samantha. What mechanisms are at play with reducing pest damage in blocked UV conditions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we believe that for strawberries, the plastics provide some type of shading effect that might increase yield. We do know that strawberries do better under shaded conditions. So we think that might be an effect there. Um, depending on the type of UV, UVA seems to stimulate um, anti-herbivore properties from plants, well, whereas UVB can damage DNA. So these two interacting factors that are happening. 
Um, but that video I shared earlier actually has some more information and uh, literature on that question. Terrific. And in the interest of time, we'll move forward. There are a couple more questions that we can circle back around to and um, or we can answer online. So um, the next presentation is by Susan Schoifele and uh, it's updates from the Brassica Pest Control Collaborative. And she comes to us from uh, UMass Extension. Hi everybody. My name is Sue Schoifele. I'm from UMass Extension where I work with the vegetable team here. And I wanted to present on uh, our ACER research and extension project called the Brassica Pest Collaborative. It's a research and outreach with Brassica growers on managing insect pests. Um, and it's fun to be presenting about this at the Northeast IPM online conference because that's actually where this project started. Um, several years ago now, I learned about research that Anna Legrand at UConn was doing using cut flowers um, to attract beneficial insects to parasitize caterpillars and brassicas. And I was doing similar work with cabbage aphids, so we got together and um, linked up with some other colleagues from around the Northeast region. Um, at Cornell Cooperative Extension, we have Dan and Farouk on Long Island and Becky Seidman at UNH and myself. And um, we just realized that we were all working on management of insect pests and brassicas on our own and better to get together and share what we're seeing in the field, what our research um, was finding and collaborate as much as possible. And then um, do a lot of outreach, of course, with growers to let them know what we're finding, if anything new is working. Um, so we, th this is our, the end of our third year, we do have an extension because of COVID, but um, we've been working on alternative reduced risk or organic insecticides for various pests, um, cultural practices like using mulches or um, here, this is cabbage root maggot where we have some insecticide treatments, but also looking at exclusion netting and plastic mulch to reduce cabbage root maggot uh, damage. Uh, we're definitely looking at a lot of insectary planting. So in New Hampshire, Mass, and also Connecticut, um, we uh, planted um, the same experiment in several sites and got some interesting data from that, looking at um, relative attractiveness of different flower species for um, aphid eating serpent flies, um, as well as other parasitoids, um, parasitoids of cabbage aphid and caterpillar. Um, this study was one of Anna's in Connecticut. Um, so I, I don't wanna, I don't have time to talk at all really about the research, um, but I just wanted to um, share this project um, and just reiterate the, the value in these sort of quick lightning talks from Northeast IPM. So thanks for checking it out. This is our website and thanks of course to Sarah and to all of our collaborators. Lovely, thank you, Susan. And we're going to move along to Demi and Nunes' uh, presentation on developing a perennial living mulch system to manage insects pests in northeastern cantaloupe fields. And uh, he comes to us from the University of Maryland. Hello, everyone. My name is Demi Nunez. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a member of Dr. Saruti Hook's lab at the University of Maryland. Today, I'll be talking to you all about the ongoing research in our lab investigating the viability of using a living mulch system to enhance natural biocontrol in Maryland cantaloupe production. Many of you might already know what a living mulch is, but just in case, the term is used to refer to any cover crop that is kept alive throughout a primary cash crop's life cycle. 
They are used for a variety of things, like improving soil quality, suppressing weeds, and in our case, diversifying crop fields to support a wider and more abundant array of beneficial arthropods, such as spiders, ground beetles, and parasitic wasps. Past work in the lab conducted by Jermaine Hines and Hannah Call has shown some promise using this kind of strategy with red clover and sun hemp and cucurbits like cucumber and zucchini. Of course, biocontrol strategies can vary widely in effectiveness based on geography and uh, agricultural system. So the goal of my research is to see if similar benefits can be conferred to a cantaloupe system using a similar strategy. Cantaloupe and other cucurbits have a wide array of pests, including but not limited to cucumber beetles and various aphids. Striped cucumber beetles are known to be especially devastating. The big issue isn't so much feeding itself, but transmission of diseases like bacterial wilt and various mosaic viruses. Normally to prevent this, growers use very aggressive, proactive chemical treatments throughout the cantaloupe's life cycle. But these practices can cost up to a third of some growers' variable annual expenses, and as we know, the off-target effects uh, can be very harmful to pollinators and beneficial insects and lead to a host of other problems. So we believe many growers, especially smaller scale growers, would be receptive to more affordable and more environmentally friendly tools for pest reduction. I chose two cold tolerant perennial cover crops that could be sown the fall before the cantaloupe. This is so they can re-emerge early in the spring and establish themselves before more competitive weeds could gain a toehold. This practice allows for cover crops to become very well established and lets you choose less aggressive plants that are less likely to compete with your primary cash crop. It's just very important that you get good ground coverage so they can suppress the more aggressive weeds that would come up in their place. Allside clover was chosen because of the proven effectiveness of clover in similar systems, and because it is less aggressive than other common species such as red clover to reduce the chances that it would compete with and harm uh, crop yield from the cash crop. Virginia wild rye was chosen because of its structural distinctness from more common leguminous living mulches evaluated for similar purposes as well as research that suggests the root systems of perennial grasses may provide good harborage for overwintering wolf spiders and ground beetles, possibly reducing the need for outside colonization of the plots in the spring. To get an idea of what is out there, we used sticky cards, pitfall traps, and foliar counts over the life cycle of the cantaloupe. Pitfall traps and sticky cards went out two weeks after planting and were left out for a week at a time and this was repeated three times to get an idea of the early, mid, and late season arthropod assemblages across the cantaloupe's development. Foliar counts were done once a week starting at roughly the same time and continued until harvest. Overall, we didn't see a difference in most arthropod groups we observed, but I'll pick out a couple that did stick out. On these graphs, you can see the average number of detections or captures on the y-axis mapped across the sample dates along the x-axis. The linear model I used found that there was an overall treatment effect on striped cucumber beetle abundance in both sticky cards and foliar counts. Using a pairwise comparison of each treatment and date though, only one date using each monitoring method revealed a statistically significant difference between treatments. There were fewer striped cucumber beetle foliar detections in the clover plots in mid-August and fewer sticky card captures in the wild rye plots on the final date. Overall, cucumber beetle detections across the summer were surprisingly low, which might make it harder to pick out clearer differences. But by raw averages at least, cucumber beetles were most abundant in the control treatment on every date and across every sampling method. So perhaps when the experiment is repeated next summer, we might be able to see clearer differences. Natural enemy detections were very low this summer as well. I didn't see statistical differences in parasitoids and many other predators outside of spiders, but spiders were generally more abundant in the clover as opposed to the uh, conventional wild rye treatments. Foliar counts of spiders showed multiple dates where the clover treatment outperformed the conventional and wild rye treatments in spider detections, though it is interesting to note that this performance in the final two dates especially is more consistent with the conventional treatment than the other living mulch. Spider detections in the pitfall traps were low as well. They were exclusively wolf spiders, which isn't you know, necessarily to be unexpected on the ground, and once again the clover treatment appeared to be more favorable to spiders than the control in wild rye. For next year the cover crops have already been planted, with 50% higher seeding rate. I'm hoping that this added biomass, and perhaps just a more insect and spider heavy summer in general, might be able to help draw out more distinct treatment effects in this system in the future. Great, wonderful, thank you very much. So um, I am not seeing that we have any questions, so pop your questions in now into the Q&A or into the chat and we can, uh, we can uh, pass them um, along. Um, and it looks like the questions that we've had before have been answered. Uh, so Glenn Kohler has asked the question, did you account for multiple testing bias in your statistical separations? I 
And that must that must be a question for Damien. Want to read the question? Yes, sure. Uh, did you account for multiple testing bias in your statistical uh, separations? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I had a, a lot of help with the stats from a, one of Sruti's older grad students. Okay, all right, we can find out the answer to that. It's no problem. And uh, Deb Grantham had asked, uh, do you have a control of no-till? Yes, I do. All right, great. So. Um, you know, no, no, I take that back. Sorry. It was a, uh, my control was just the conventional till. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, all right. Wonderful. Okay. Well, with that, um, I think, um, uh, Kevin, if we want to move forward with the next uh, two presentations, we have uh, Diane uh, Slotnikov, who's uh, speaking about uh, red seaweed is a methane reducing and parasite preventing supplement for organic sheep and she comes from us from Z Farms Organic. Hello, my name is Nicole. I want to thank you for letting me share some really exciting research findings. In particular, we studied impact of using asparagopsis, more commonly known as red algae or seaweed, as a feed additive in sheep. Principal contributors to this research are listed on this page. We want to demonstrate that using asparagopsis as a feed additive would significantly reduce methane expulsion by sheep. This is a laudable goal, given that the billion sheep account roughly 8% of global atmospheric emissions. While there have been a number of studies supporting this finding, we explored linkage to impact of seaweed on parasite load and microbiome of the sheep. To gather necessary data, we have conducted a six week field trial aimed at determining the impact of additional seaweed feed on sheep methane production, parasite load, and microbiome. The experiment was designed to evaluate results among three groups of randomly assigned sheep. The first group was the control. It was served as a baseline and was not given any seaweed. Group two was given seaweed supplement equal to 0.5% of daily dry matter intake. Group three received higher dose equal to 2% of DMI. The methane testing was done at the start of the trial, then at three week and six week points. The parasite stool testing was done on four occasions. First one was one week before the start of the trial, which was also the last day that animals were still on winter paddocks. Then three more times coinciding with methane testing. Once animals were pastured, we also collected three samples for biome test. Today, we have results from methane and parasite count but we are still waiting completion of the microbiome testing. Methane expulsion results were generally in line with expectations for the control group and group three. The chart on the left shows average methane for each group. You can see a sharp decline in the yellow line versus blue line after just three weeks of feed, which extended into the six week period. The chart on the right shows median methane for each group. The results are virtually identical whether we look at average or median for control and group three. However, results for group two are different from expectations and prior studies. There are two notable differences. First, seaweed had very little impact on average methane production, as shown by the green line on the left chart. However, median sheep, as seen on the right chart, did experience significant improvement, but only after six weeks. The difference between average and median results is due to outliers, which experience deterioration. We want to better understand this anomaly. Looking simply at the number of sheep showing improvement, we find that the control group is consistent with random chance with the same number showing improvement as deterioration. Likewise, group three is consistent with remarkable 93% of the sheep showing improvement. However, in group two, only 10 of the 15 sheep experienced reduction in methane. A closer look reveals that four of the five unresponsive had unusually high levels of strongulus and emeria parasite. This is directionally consistent with other studies that suggested linkage between health of the sheep and methane expulsion. Disruption of biome was thought to be one of the causal factors. Our hypothesis is that higher levels of seaweed was somehow better able to counteract sickness and change in biome. The question is whether seaweed is making the sheep healthier or just controlling the methane. There is some support for both mechanisms. 
The chart shows parasite load of a median sheep. We note that the biggest improvement comes as the flock was moved from winter paddocks to pasture. Once on the pasture, group two and three continued to see decline in strontulus parasite load, while control group was unchanged. Still, we can't explain why parasite improvement for group two is better than for group three, while methane is reversed. Overall, our conclusions are supportive of 60 to 70% reduction of methane expulsion from use of asparagopsis as feed supplement. Results were most compelling at 2% DMI level. It should be noted that our sheep are organically raised with rotational grazing. This may explain why our baseline methane measurements were only half of the at observed in other studies. As we analyze biome data, we hope to show a clearer linkage between health and methane. As of today, we observe that at higher DMI levels, seaweed seems to overwhelm the impact of parasites on methane production, which appears to be new and important finding. Wonderful, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, and our next presentation is by Glenn Kohler and he's gonna talk about some new weather resources for IPM in the Northeast. And he comes to us from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. I'm Glenn Kaler, University of Maine Cooperative Extension. And I'd like to talk about a project we did over the last year, um, Lily Calderwood, Sean Burkle, Aaron Roche, and myself. And we had some help from Shauna Annis and Robin Tooley. So what happened here was I've been doing ag radar, which takes weather data and translates it into decision support for apple growers um, for a long time. And that system runs on weather data that has to be available to be ingested automatically into the computer. It's easy to see weather data on the internet, but it's not so easy to get data that you can bring into a program and analyze. So when I lost my vendor for my weather data, um, I started talking to Sean Burkle, who's our state climatologist. He runs this system called Climate Reanalyzer, which is actually world famous. And he is a computer whiz, and he knows how to write code to grab weather data, forecast, and observations from the NOAA databases. This is not easy stuff to do, and Sean's really good at it. And so out of that, we started developing this thing called Ag Eye Weather, along with some help from the Northeast Climate Hub, by the way. Yeah. So uh, Ag Eye Weather grabs this um, weather data from the NOAA databases, and we can, we're, we're running 105 sites right now across the eastern half of the United States, actually. And this is our plan for next year for sites to run in Maine. And um, we pick those sites for different commodities so that everybody gets a little bit of action. And the red ones are the orchards, you know, the, the orange ones are the dairy, et cetera. MCO stands for Maine Climate Office. Sean had some of his own sites he was running already. And so what AgEye does is it generates these data streams that you can it generates reports you can look at either on fax or by email, and they they look sort of like this. Um, and it it isn't just hourly weather; um, it's also daily summaries. We can't show it all here, but there's also a focus on agricultural weather. So there are things like um, solar radiation, evapotranspiration, things that are a little bit harder to find in your standard leaf wetness that are a little bit hard to find in a standard weather forecast. Now, this is where Lily Calderwood comes in. She is a um, wild blueberry specialist at University of Maine, and that industry has a network of weather stations they use for disease forecasting. And Lily was very interested in our weather work and how could we plug this stuff in to increase the access to and use of weather data by the blueberry industry. So Lily, um, Sean and I got a, a small grant from the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions at University of Maine. And we had these focus groups meetings with groups of vegetable and small fruit growers, wild blueberry growers, and apple growers. 
And the most surprising thing that for me that came out of it was that, and I think for all of us, was that only about a third of the growers were currently using any type of weather-based decision support, but 86% were interested in it. The other thing that was striking to all of us was we already were into weather, but and we knew growers are into weather, but just how intensely they're into weather was just fascinating. They are really, it runs their lives, especially during the growing season. What the apple growers wanted was continued access to ag radar. Um, they wanted longer range forecast with extra variables. And this was, these things were true for all the groups, the blueberry growers, the apple growers, and the vegetable and small fruit growers. A lot of talk about phone apps because they want to be able to check the weather in the field with their smartphone. And they want um, alerts about things that come to them so they don't have to go looking for it, you know, a frost event or um, some critical event. They want to be notified. And finally, um, because of that interest in longer range forecasting, uh, one thing that I started developing is a newsletter that focuses on the longer range forecast. And it takes Again, there's not enough time to go into details, but one of the summary charts in that is a, a view of all the weather across different time spans. And this is for temperature, but there's another one for, for precipitation and soil moisture. And it just gives a synoptic view of what the long-term picture is to help you synthesize a lot of information that's elsewhere in the report. And that is my five minutes. Thank you. That was really, really interesting too. So. Heads up, it looks like it's going to be cold in February, folks, at least in Western Maine. Um, okay, so we had a couple of questions uh, that came through um, about um, the uh, sheet presentation. And so the first is uh, from Glenn, and he asked, what component of asparagopsis causes methane reduction? What other seaweeds have the same component? And is it true that um, this is, um, that only this one type of seaweed has been shown to be useful for this purpose. So this seaweed has a lot of biologically active uh, compounds that might be responsible. And at this time, they think the most active is iodine and bromine containing uh, organic compounds. So all seaweed are known to have high iodine uh, content. Most brown seaweed, red seaweed, and green seaweed have the least. But brown seaweed and red, this particular seaweed, Asparagopsis taxiformis, has very high iodine content. But what's unique to this red seaweed, it also have very high bromine content. So the experiments were done with the brown seaweed, particularly with kelp different type of kelps before. And it did show some methane inhibition, but not to the extent. So current thinking, think, current thinking is that this is just bromine, which inhibits uh, specific, specific methane producing bacteria in the rumen of the sheep. Great. And there was another follow-up question is, what is the source of the asparagopsis? Asparagopsis widely grows, it grows in the wild in many areas of the world, in, 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 including Australia, Indian, Pacific Ocean. And uh, right now, because of the interest of the farming interest and climate mitigation interest, uh, there are several farms, uh, seaweed farms, that grow it uh, kind of for research and development, and they hope to, to grow it commercially if the research holds. So, so this particular came from, from the farm in the Pacific, organic farm in Pacific. Great, and we have time, I think, for one question before we need to wrap up. Uh, John Lee Cox asked, Glenn, can you give an idea of the resolution of the ag -Eye weather data? As you know, we have issues with extrapolating field conditions from even nearby weather station data in terms of accuracy. And he said, thanks for your work on this. Yeah, so the forecast comes in different phases. The immediate, the first 18 hours and 36 hours are at three kilometers. So that's 1.8 miles. And then longer, as you get longer range, it gets up to um, 12K, so eight miles. Okay, great. 
All right. Well, there are a couple more questions, but I'm going to wrap up. Yeah, so in the interest of uh, completing on time, we do have um, a couple of things to share with you. Uh, one is a poll, uh, which should show up on your screen momentarily. Uh, just to ask you some questions about uh, today's uh, session and to get your feedback. It's always useful for us. That pops up on your screen. And um, if you can just take a minute, I think there's five questions in there, so it shouldn't take too long. And we'd appreciate your feedback. And I think you can answer it anonymously too. And um... Yana, the, the poll question just disappeared. Uh, they just for the attendees or for the panelists also? Uh, it should be for everyone, I think, it should show up. Um, there is a certain setup where... Um, it's back. Oh, it, it came back. Okay, yeah, I think... They're back now. Yeah, I think it froze. There we go. And if you are an attendee and can't speak and you're not seeing the poll, there is a certain co uh, combination of Zoom and and iPad and poll that where it won't show up for you. So don't stress if you're not seeing it, you may have that particular combination. So it might be my computer, but for questions two and five, um, it looks like the questions are cut off for me. Uh, I think that's your computer. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I'm seeing them. Uh, Nina Jenkins said it's the same uh, for her too. Huh. That's odd. Yeah, we've realized over doing this over the summer that it's not uh, infallible. Um, we haven't quite figured out what combination doesn't work for people. All right, we'll give it like 10, 15 more seconds and then we'll share the results with you. Oh, good question. Uh, Nina asked if I can read the full question for two and five, good idea. Number two is how likely are you to recommend um, the research update conference to a colleague? And uh, number five is, as a result of this uh, conference, how likely are you to increase your implementation of IPM? I'm realizing we probably need another response for the number five, which is um, not applicable. <laughs> oh, great. There are a couple of questions if people want to type the answers in as a question for Glenn. Um, and you can you can just type your answer or we can try and capture these uh, and answer them at a later date. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so everybody has answered. So um, seems like most people really enjoyed uh, this morning's session as did I um, and would recommend uh, the, the update conference. Um, and it resulted in an increase in knowledge, which is just what we want to hear. And, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, um, that you'll uh, continue to network. I uh, see some continuation in networking and uh, an increase of the use of IPM. So all good things that we like to hear from, from our presentations. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to remind you that the next uh, research update conference is Wednesday, March 31st from 10.30 till 12. It's already fully subscribed, uh, but if you know someone who would like to uh, present, we do have a waiting list because usually something happens, uh, people's teaching schedules change or something comes up. Um, so feel free to pass it along in case there's someone who you think would want to present. Um, we have a find a colleague place on our website where um, you can post a profile and um, it's a good way of networking, finding other people in the Northeast who are interested in the kind of topics that you're interested in, finding a collaborator for a research project uh, for a site. And uh, the, the archive of today's webinar is going to be on our website probably in about a week. 
I'll send you an email and um, and it will stay up there for uh, for quite a long time so you can come back and watch it as often as you like. And uh, with that, I just uh, thank everybody for their time and participation and thoughtfulness. And uh, I really always enjoy these. I kind of enjoy the uh, the pace and uh, the kind of the short, sharp, wonderful uh, nuggets. So thank you for all the work and <clears throat> hours and hours and hours of work in the field and in the lab and writing that uh, makes these little short five minute things uh, possible. So with that, uh, I will end. Uh, can I just hold it for a minute while Glenn's answering the questions? Just don't end it. Sure, yeah, we can do that. So actually what I can do is um, I can leave this open. And so um, so if folks want to just stay on and answer on the questions and read the responses, we can also at the end um, download uh, the Q&A and the chat and we can put that with the recording. So if you want to come back and see someone's responses, uh, you can do that. So, so with that, um, I will stop talking. I will let people answer questions. And uh, thanks for your participation today.